Cambridge is, of course, a wonderful place to be doing astronomy. Uh, we're talking in a room with a portrait of Isaac Newton looking down on us. You can see in the background here the room where Newton spent 30 years of his life, and he was perhaps the greatest scientist ever to come to Cambridge. But there is a fine tradition, and in Cambridge we have a collection of astronomers which is fully equal to what you find anywhere else in the world, and therefore it's an extremely stimulating place to be studying the subject, and we have a continuous flow of students and uh, postdocs and researchers who are giving us a very broad perspective on all kinds of astronomy. And so I've been fortunate to be part of this community for most of my working life. Well, I was an undergraduate at Cambridge University and I read mathematics. And I decided by the end of that I didn't really feel cut out to be a mathematician and I wanted to really apply the maths and physics I'd learned to something interesting. And by a bit of luck, I managed to get taken on as a research student to study astronomy and cosmology with a very inspirational supervisor, Dr. Dennis Sharma. And it was actually a very good time to get into the subject because it was when new things were starting to happen, the first evidence for the Big Bang, the first evidence for things called quasars, the first debate about black holes, etc. So I was lucky to get into a subject where things were starting and moving fast. I'm interested in how the universe evolved over 13.7 billion years or thereabouts from a hot, amorphous Big Bang to the present complex cosmos that we see around us and which contains us. And this happened by various stages. First atoms formed, then the first stars, then galaxies, and then planets. And we want to understand how this happened. And we have an advantage over, say, geologists, because we can actually observe the past. Because when we look at things a long way away, we see them as they were a long time ago. And so we can check our theories by looking at not only whether they fit the present universe, but whether they explain what things were like one billion, two billion, three billion, four billion years ago, etc. So that's one thing I'm interested in doing. I've got two other interests, really. One is to study extreme phenomena in the cosmos, to study the most extreme explosions, which are fascinating to physicists because they are occasions when you can actually test the laws of nature to breaking point, as it were, under conditions you couldn't possibly achieve in the lab. So I'm interested in that. And also in a more speculative vein, I'm interested in the uh, um, physics of the very beginning and also in whether there could be anything beyond what we can see in the universe, the huge region we can see in the universe, what we normally call the universe, may not be all of physical reality. And I speculate about whether there could be a lot more beyond what we can see. We couldn't make any progress at all in astronomy and cosmology if the laws of nature were so anarchic that they were different in every star and every galaxy. We know that's not the case. And essentially what we do is make observations of distant objects and try to apply to them the laws of physics which we establish in the lab. We do for the stars and the galaxies what a geophysicist does for the Earth, trying to interpret what's going on in terms of the laws we can understand. And that's essentially uh, what we do. Um, and of course, we sometimes run up against phenomena where the conditions are so extreme, so far beyond what we could achieve in the lab or even in the biggest accelerator, that we aren't so sure about the laws of nature. It's remarkable that when we look at the light from a very distant galaxy, light that's taken 10 billion years on its journey towards us, we can take its spectrum and infer the properties of the atoms that emitted that light. And so far as we can tell, those atoms obey just the same laws as atoms in the lab. There's no firm evidence that the laws of nature are different in any part of the universe that we can see. It could be that there are domains far beyond what we can see even the aftermaths of other Big Bangs, which are part of physical reality, but not directly observable. And the laws of nature could be different there. And one very interesting speculation is that there could be 
many Big Bangs, giving rise to cosmoses governed by different laws of nature. And we find ourselves in just one. It could be that many of the other cosmoses are, as it were, stillborn, because the laws governing them don't allow the kind of complexity that we observe in our universe to evolve in them. They might, for instance, not have a force of gravity. They might have equal amounts of matter and antimatter, so it all annihilates. They might not allow complex chemistry, just hydrogen, or they might, in other respects, not allow complexity. So one speculation, which is fascinating in my view, is that perhaps the laws of nature, which we think of as universal, are, in this grander perspective, just as it were, local parochial bylaws in the cosmic patch we can observe, which is a tiny part of the overall universe. I always say it's very good for any student to start research when everything is new or when there are new techniques, because otherwise you have to be tackling the problems that the old guys got stuck on, whereas if you are in a fast developing subject, you can think about problems that are new to everyone, and therefore you are at no handicap compared to more experienced people. One attractive feature of science is that it's international. Our discoveries can be shared with people all over the world. Science is a universal culture, common to all nationalities and to all faiths. That makes science a topic that we can discuss across all cultural barriers and makes the practice of science very international. There's nothing new about this, actually, because if you look back to the 17th century, when the Royal Society was founded, there were lots of correspondence between scientists in Britain and across Europe. Europeans published in British journals and everyone followed the exploration of the new world going on at that time. And in the Napoleonic Wars, Humphrey Davy was allowed to travel freely in France. And during the depth of the Cold War, there was contact between scientists in the Soviet Union and those in Britain and the United States. So science transcends cultural and political barriers. And that gives scientists perhaps a special role in politics. And that plus their long-term view means that I think it's important that scientists should be more vocal in discussing the issues facing the world because political discourse tends to focus on the uh, immediate and that tends to trump more important issues which are longer term and broader. Whatever part of the world we live in, we're going to have to contend with uh, the fact that the world's getting more crowded and each individual is more demanding of resources, energy and food. And if we are to cope with this runaway, more crowded world, then we need to deploy science and technology in the optimum way, a way that requires international partnerships. And I think scientists do have a special role in trying to uh, promote this discussion among the general public and among politicians. Of course, the decisions on how science is applied shouldn't just be made by scientists because scientists have no specific wisdom in ethics and politics and economics. And the big decisions involve all those things as well. But I think scientists do have an important role in engaging with the public and politicians to ensure that these important long-term issues remain high on the agenda. I think if you, if you were to ask what is something which fascinates us all and to which we'd like to know the answer in our lifetimes, it's whether there is life beyond the Earth. We now know that there are zillions of planets orbiting other stars, many of them rather like the Earth probably. But what we don't yet know is whether on those other planets life got started and whether if it got started it evolved into the complex biosphere like on Earth in which advanced creatures like us could have emerged. So whether life is ubiquitous in the cosmos or whether we're unique and where other life exists, if it does, is a fascinating question. I think this is something which uh, not only astronomers, but a far wider public are interested in.